So next we talk about catalytic ozone destruction. And this is the method that gets the most amount of attention since it's primarily the mode of ozone destruction that's responsible for the formation of ozone holes. It's also the primary mode of ozone destruction that is affected by anthropomorphic activity or, or man-made activities on Earth. And so this is really where we'll focus quite a bit of attention. And we'll discuss this more in chapter two as well. So among catalytic ozone destruction processes, there's actually two mechanisms. There is mechanism one, which occurs primarily in the upper stratosphere. And I'll explain why in a moment. And this is where we have some group, some X group, and we'll discuss what that means in a moment, that comes and abstracts an oxygen atom from ozone in a reaction. And that generates an XO group and then O2. So that's the first step of ozone destruction. And then this XO group will react with a single oxygen atom that exists in the upper stratosphere. And that a single oxygen atom will abstract the oxygen atom from the XO group to regenerate X and then form another molecule of O2. And this is why we refer to this as being catalytic. Well, there's two reasons why we refer to it as being catalytic. The first is because the X group participates in the reaction but is not consumed by the reaction. That's one requirement for a catalyst. The second, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is uh, the fact that the X group speeds up this decomposition. So when we look at these two reactions here, one and two, if I add them together simply as I would add mathematical equations, what I will see is that I have, if I add all of the reactions, I've got X plus O3 plus XO and O going to my products. And what I'll notice is just like a mathematical equation, anything that appears in the same form on both sides can cancel out. So if I look here, I'll notice that X appears in the same form on both sides, XO appears in the same form on both sides, and I'm left with a net reaction of simply O3 plus a single oxygen atom goes to two O2 molecules. And this looks familiar because it's actually the minor pathway for the uncatalyzed uh, reaction. Now here, this is simply the net of multiple steps, but the net reaction is the same as the uncatalyzed uh, minor pathway that we had talked about previously. And this is where we come to the second part of what it means for this to be catalytic. So for, a catal for X to be a catalyst, in addition to participating but not being consumed, it also has to mean that uh, a catalyst reduces the activation energy barrier. Even if it introduces multiple steps into the reaction, it lowers the kinetic barrier for the reaction to occur. And we can illustrate this in the following diagram here where black, the black trace, is the uncatalyzed reaction, simply O3 reacting with a single oxygen atom to abstract off that oxygen atom from ozone and form two molecules of O2. And as we mentioned before, there's a very exothermic reaction. We're talking about negative 392 kilojoules per mole, but it's also not kinetically favored because of the large activation energy barrier, 17 kilojoules per mole, that makes that a slow reaction. However, when we introduce an X group such as chlorine, a single chlorine atom here, this introduces uh, a new step into the reaction, but it reduces the barrier dramatically. So the activation energy barrier drops significantly. And this, this reaction, uh, energy, this energy coordinate diagram is not drawn to scale at all. This is actually it reduces it down from 17 kilojoules per mole down to only two kilojoules per mole. So really this should be a much, much smaller pump. It should be just a little bit and it's easily overcome. And so we have, an, an, we have an additional step, but we've reduced the kinetic barrier dramatically, which then makes this process uh, much, much faster overall. Now, if we take this, these two steps, one and two up above, and sort of represent them graphically, we can show we have this kind of cycle where we go back and forth between X and XO. If you cycle between 
reactions one and two, and each cycle de uh, destroys one ozone molecule and then end up generating two oxygen molecules. And this is of concern because it's net destructive in ozone, and there are actually a number of different groups that can act as these catalysts, these X groups. Single atoms of chlorine or bromine can, but it doesn't have to be single atoms. It can also be groups such as OH or NO. Now these are not ions. These are single, these are um, groups that do not have a full octet of electrons. So OH, it might look to you at first glance like the hydroxide ion, but it's not. O does not have a full octet, it has one unpaired electron, and thus it's termed a uh, free radical. So all of these actually have a single unpaired electron, and thus uh, have, uh, would be termed radicals. Now, we have, these, we have this process here, and this occurs primarily in the upper stratosphere because it involves single oxygen atoms. Remember, in the upper stratosphere and above the stratosphere, single oxygen atoms are more prevalent because the air pressure is low, the light intensity of UVC is higher, so you get photochemical dissociation of oxygen to form these single oxygen atoms, but then they don't react with O2 immediately because there's not a lot of O2 around, and the O2 that does exist around uh, is frequently dissociated by uh, UVC. So there's a decent concentration of single oxygen atoms in the upper stratosphere. Now, what does this look like for a few examples? And I want to highlight some natural examples. So we'll mention and talk quite a bit about the fact that ozone or catalytic ozone destruction is contributed to dramatic, uh, greatly by anthropomorphic activity and emissions, but it's not only man's activity on Earth that, that is uh, involved with these catalytic processes. There's, there's catalytic ozone uh, destruction that's occurring all the time that's attributed only to natural processes. So let's just go through a few examples of those. For example, if we're forming NO or, the ni or nitric oxide uh, for, as the X group, that comes from nitrous oxide or laughing gas, as it's also known which is actually produced in uh, sizable quantities by soil bacteria and fungi, and as well as from uh, ocean bacteria. And some of that gas rises up through the troposphere and eventually makes it into the stratosphere and into the upper stratosphere. And then those uh, nitrous oxide molecules will, can react with an excited state oxygen atom. That excited state might come from photochemical dissociation of O2 or or maybe direct excitation in some form, or um, some other processes. And that excited state oxygen atom reacts with uh, nitrous oxide, or N2O. And most of the time, that reaction actually does not form NO. It actually cleaves off the oxygen atom to form N2 and O2. But some of the time, it will react to form two molecules of NO. That is the source of the stratospheric concentration of uh, nitric oxide, or NO. And that NO goes on to then uh, act as the X group in these reactions. So you have NO comes and abstracts an oxygen atom from ozone. That forms NO2. And an, uh, an O2 molecule, that NO2 then reacts with a single oxygen atom in the upper stratosphere, which abstracts an oxygen atom away and re, re reproduces or reforms nitric oxide and, another, and then another molecule of O2, so we can sum these to generate our reaction three as the net reaction. Additionally, OH itself, this comes from another natural source. So methane, that's a common gas. Uh, some of that rises up through the troposphere into the stratosphere, and then if that reacts with an excited uh, state oxygen atom that will abstract a hydrogen to generate the OH radical and the methyl radical. Now this methyl radical will rapidly react with oxygen to then eventually get oxidized all the way up to CO2, but the OH radical persists and then acts as a catalytic ozone destruction 
agent in the in identical processes to those described above. Finally, there's a lot of emphasis on chlorine as an ozone destructive agent for good reason, but not all chlorine in the stratosphere comes from man-made activity. There's actually quite a bit that comes from natural uh, natural production from methyl chloride that rises primarily from the oceans, rises up into the stratus, uh, through the troposphere into the stratosphere, and then is photochemically dissociated into the methyl radical and the chlorine radical. Methyl radical, as mentioned above, reacts with oxygen and then gets oxidized all the way up to CO2, but chlorine then goes on to act as a very potent ozone destructive uh, agent as shown in these reactions, but the, the reactions here are identical to what we've seen above. And this all occurs in the upper stratosphere where single oxygen atoms are prevalent due to the intensity of the UVC light, which associates O2, and, uh, and, and the low air pressure, so we don't get rapid recombination of that oxygen atom with O2 or uh, with ozone, or even with another uh, oxygen atom. But in the lower stratosphere, the air pressure is much higher, the UVC light intensity is much lower, and the concentration of single oxygen atoms is just so much lower that, that the mechanism one really doesn't affect, it really doesn't occur much in the lower stratosphere. And you'll remember that the lower stratosphere is where the majority of ozone actually exists in the ozone layer. And so mechanism two is actually the one that gets the most attention when it comes to ozone destruction. So in this case, we still have the same first reaction. Some catalyst, X group, abstracts an oxygen atom from ozone to generate XO and O2. But then rather, there's no single oxygen atoms for that XO group to react with, or very, very few. And so we sort of look at this reaction again and say, say that we had another X group, let's call it X prime. Now, X and X prime may be identical, or they may be different. One could be chlorine, and one could be OH radical, one could be bromine, the other one could be chlorine, or they could both be the same. And the same process occurs, that catalyst abstracts an oxygen atom to form X prime O plus O2. And then rather than reacting with single oxygen atoms, which we just mentioned, that concentration is very low, these two XO or an X prime O groups will actually combine together to form what's known as a peroxide, XOO, X prime. And this peroxide, which is uh, where we have an oxygen and oxygen bo single bond here, this peroxide actually will decompose spontaneously to generate a single molecule of O2 and then the liberated free atoms X and X prime, which again may or may not be identical. If we take all four of these reactions and sum them, we'll note that all of the X and XO or X prime and X prime O groups cancel out, and we're left only with a net reaction where we have conversion of ozone directly into O2. And this is of course the net reaction, the overall reaction, that of course undergoes these four uh, individual steps. Now, as mentioned, mechanism two is the one that gets the most amount of attention in catalytic ozone destruction because it occurs in the lower stratosphere where the ozone layer is, and it is also a net destructive and affected the most by anthropomorphic activity. Now, when we talk about mechanism two, the X group that gets the most amount of attention is chlorine and then also bromine. Those are the two X groups that tend to have their concentration affected the most by anthropomorphic activity. And they're also very potent ozone destructive agents or very potent catalysts for these reactions. Now, when we talk about them though, chlorine gets the most attention by far, primarily because it has the highest concentration of the two, chlorine and bromine, in the stratosphere. Uh, 
But it's important to note that 99% of the time that chlorine actually is inactive. It's not in a form where it would destroy ozone. So if we, if we look at the kind of reactions above and also lump in um, mechanism one, we can see that the two states that are involved in the catalytic cycle are chlorine, the single atomic chlorine and chlorine monoxide. Those are the two that are involved in the catalytic cycle. But most of the time, chlorine doesn't exist in either of those forms. It's actually sequestered in an inactive form, either HCl, uh, hydrochloric acid, or in this chlorine, uh, this kind of uh, chlorine nitrate uh, shown here. And we'll look at both of these and, and why chlorine is sequestered in that way. So it turns out that the reaction between chlorine and NO2, or sorry, chlorine monoxide and NO2 is extremely exothermic. So this is very downhill, very favored, negative 336.4 kilojoules per mole. And so the chlorine monoxide that's formed is rapidly sequestered into this, uh, into this ClO NO2 inactive form. Now, during the daytime, this, uh, this, chlorine nitrate uh, molecule or ClONO2 can be photochemically dissociated. So essentially that's just the reverse of this reaction here. So the enthalpy is the reverse here or the opposite signs so of positive 336.4 kilojoules per mole. And if we plug that into our equation, we can come out with a wavelength of dissociation for this of being about 355 nanometers. This is uh, UVA light. And so during the daytime, depending on the latitude, the lifetime of this chlorine nitrate molecule is about an hour or so, depending on altitude and, and latitude as well, uh, and, and light intensity. But at night, this reaction, uh, the reaction lies entirely to the right, and so at night, chlorine, uh, the chlorine monoxide is entirely sequestered into this chlorine nitrate form and thus not reactive for ozone destruction. Also, uh, if we're in the atomic chlorine uh, state, that is also generally sequestered as uh, HCl, so reaction with methane, which of course is a trace gas, but so is the chlorine, uh, and uh, both exist in the stratosphere we can get abstraction of a hydrogen atom from, uh, from methane to generate hydrochloric acid and then the methyl radical. Now, you might not think this would be of that great importance because it's actually an endothermic reaction, so this is slightly uphill, but the key here is that it's only slightly uphill. It's a very small uh, uphill barrier. And so although this reaction is slow, it's not insignificant. And, uh, and so not only is the chlorine monoxide sequestered, uh, but if, it, if chlorine exists as the atomic uh, it, atom, it also tends to be sequestered uh, out as HCl. Now, this can be, uh, this can be reversed uh, by abstraction of that hydrogen atom by OH radical. So during both the day and the night, we've got, uh, we've kind of got an equilibrium here between these two. And so you will have some small percentage of chlorine and during the day, chlorine monoxide that is present in, in, in those forms in the active form. But it's only about 1% of the total chlorine in the stratosphere that exists in the active form. Bromine, on the other hand, is actually maybe more of a problem if it existed in the same concentrations as chlorine, because unlike chlorine, bromine exists primarily in the active form. So uh, where we get bromine in the atmosphere, we hadn't mentioned that before, but it, it comes uh, not only from anthropomorphic emission sources of brominated molecules, but it comes from natural emissions uh, or natural formation of methyl bromide, which can rise up through the atmosphere and then be photochemically dissociated into methyl radical and, and the bromine radical. Now, the methyl radical we've already talked about that gets oxidized up to CO2 by reaction with oxygen, but then the bromine radical is the one that we really care about. 
Now, the active forms of bromine in terms of ozone destruction are the same as chlorine. It's the atomic bromine and then the bromine monoxide. And the inactive forms are also the same or analogous, HBr, hydrobromic acid, and then the bromine nitrate. But there's some very significant differences, and we can calculate some of these energy differences using heat formation data. But if I look at the formation of bromine nitrate, I will see it's still downhill, negative 53 kilojoules per mole. But if I remember, the reaction between chlorine and NO2 was downhill by more than 300 kilojoules per mole. Here, we're only about 53. So this is much less exothermic, much less favorable. And so it's not an instant sink for all of the BRO or the bromine monoxide uh, in, in this case. And uh, additionally, the photochemical dissociation for bromine nitrate, because the reverse reaction, because it's only downhill by so little, the reverse reaction is only requires 53.4 kilojoules per mole. That means essentially that any wavelength less than 2,240 nanometers, that's all the way out in the infrared region. So essentially almost any wavelength of light that, that bromine nitrate will absorb uh, in wavelengths shorter than like the infrared, into the infrared region, so a whole span of the electromagnetic spectrum, any of those wavelengths that it will absorb will cause or power this, uh, this photochemical dissociation. And so bromine, uh, the lifetime of bromine nitrate is thus much shorter in the stratosphere than uh, chlorine nitrate. And it's, it's uh, so the bromine monoxide is not sequestered entirely in the bromine nitrate form. Additionally, the, the reaction of bromine, of atomic bromine with methane to form HBr as the inactive form, unlike chlorine, which is only slightly uphill, this reaction is significantly uphill. Rather than being slow, this, rather than simply being slow but significant, this is slow, very slow, and not, uh, and not very significant. Additionally, even if HBr does form, HBr is rapidly dissociated by absorption of light at any wavelength less than 326 nanometers, so essentially UVB, UVC light here. And so the takeaway message essentially is that bromine exists uh, primarily in its active form rather than its inactive form. It is a very potent ozone destruction agent and actually is about 45 times more efficient at ozone destruction than chlorine is. So let's put some of these details together into a quick problem and, uh, and hopefully this will help cement a few of the principles that we've talked about as well as just kind of getting a grasp for how we write some of these reactions. So not all of the exo molecules such as NO2 survive long enough to react with oxygen atoms. So let's say this is in the upper stratosphere, for example. Some of those are just photochemically dissociated, perhaps by UVC light to X and then atomic oxygen. That atomic oxygen then reacts with ozone to reform, or with O2 to reform ozone. So write out these three steps, including the one for ozone destruction, and then deduce the net reaction. And the overall question here is, does this sequence destroy ozone overall, or is it just a null reaction? So we're asked for three reactions. One, where we have decomposition of ozone or ozone destruction by X. We have one where we have photochemical decomposition of XO into X and O. And then we have one where that atomic oxygen reacts with O2 to reform ozone. So let's just take these one at a time. First, we have the destructive process for ozone. Then we have the photochemical decomposition. I should have written uh, H nu over the arrow, but essentially light is involved in this second reaction to break that molecule apart. And then third, that oxygen atom that we produce reacts with O2 
again to reform ozone. And so if we take these and add everything on both sides, X plus O3 plus XO plus O goes to XO plus O2 plus X plus O, and we'll notice that X appears on both sides, XO appears on both sides, O appears on both sides, O2 appears on both sides, and O3 appears on both sides. So essentially all of the species cancel, and this is not a net destructive process, this is simply a null cycle, something that would certainly occur and filter out UVC or UVB light from the atmosphere, but doesn't in the end result in any net loss in ozone from the stratosphere.